Hi everybody, welcome to Woolen Spinning. My name is Rachel, and as you can see, we are doing a pre-recorded episode today. The reason for that is because uh, my family and I are actually on the road. I am hoping to be able to join you in the premiere today in the live chat. So we've done this in the past, it's always a lot of fun. But if this is your first time checking out a live stream and checking out Woolen Spinning just in general, welcome, and I hope that you find something here that you are looking for. Primarily, we spend our time here talking about hand spun, talking about hand spun yarn, knitting and spinning with hand spun, and just doing all the things with basically wool, anything that you can spin into yarn. So while we do spend a lot of time talking about wool, we also talk about other things as well. I want to welcome everybody from the Patreon community to this live stream uh, and to sort of just the Patreon community in general. I see you and I want to thank you especially for your patronage and for your continued support of the community. It is the way it is and it is as vibrant as it is because of you. So thank you so much. To those who are new and just checking out the podcast for the first time, welcome. I hope that you find something here that you are looking for. You are welcome in this place and you are welcome here in, in this sort of place of crafty, fibery, makery goodness. To returning viewers, thank you for continuing to watch the show and for supporting me here on YouTube. If you don't mind taking a moment to press the like and subscribe button, I would really appreciate that. To my Canadian friends, happy Thanksgiving. It is a weekend where as a country we pause and reflect on the autumnal bounty. And for this weekend, we are actually away. Uh, we really like to go to uh, an area of the province called the Shushwap, and that is where we are this weekend. So we're probably drowning in rain and we are probably wearing toques and mitts and heavy uh, like sort of not not like winter coats, but heavy sweaters and sweatshirts and whatnot, but we just absolutely love it There's this great little pub across the street from where we like to go and We often have our Thanksgiving meal there, which is cheeseless dairy-free pizza and uh, lots of root beer and um, fries usually so um, I hope that you are celebrating wherever you are uh, doing whatever feels right for you in your area of the country. So in today's uh, episode, it, because it is pre-recorded, some of this video is actually from a while ago. I took some video while we were on our trip back at the end of August to Liard Hot Springs. So we will start off with that with sort of a general uh, reflection on my sweater knits that I was working on on that um, trip and I hope that you enjoy it. The other, sort of the rest of the show after that will be on some of my current spins in progress and some community participation because it wouldn't really be the show without at least some community participation. So I would really like to share that with you and actually instead of pre-populating it and putting it here ahead of time, I thought I would just take you right into Slack itself and share it with you there because sometimes that's just easier. So without further ado, let's get into the show. first part of the premiere, you will probably hear some highway noise behind the recording. Uh, on When I'm on the road and when we're sort of away from home, uh, I don't have access to all of my recording equipment like what I have at home. So there is highway noise in behind. It's kind of, it comes and goes a little bit depending on the semi trucks as they like went by. Even though the campground that we were staying at was um, on the highway, we were actually quite far back, but it's just the echo against the side of the mountain. So I hope that it's not too, too bad. You can always turn the volume down a little bit if it's annoying you, uh, but just so that you know that that highway noise in behind, it can't really do much about. So thank you for watching this next segment and I'll see you guys on the other side. Hi 
Hi everyone, welcome to Woolen Spinning. This is a supplementary vlog, I think. I'm not exactly sure how I'm going to release this, but it's all about sort of the projects that I've been working on while we've been away on our trip at the end of August in 2021. We drove from our home just outside of Vancouver, British Columbia, all the way up to Liard Hot Springs, which is north of Prince George, north of Dawson Creek in northern British Columbia, south of Whitehorse, Yukon. And uh, we've done this trip before. We've usually done it in, in part uh, with a bigger trip or with another trip, but it's one of our favorite places to go. And we didn't have a whole lot of time this time around, so we decided to do this trip again. I really enjoy it because I like going to this part of the province a lot. Um, it's one of my favorite parts of the world, uh, probably partially because I was born up here, <laughs> but uh, also because I just really love the north and would move back like that if we could. <laughs> so uh, let me share with you what I have been working on. I had packed uh, quite a few of my spindles and I was going to work through quite a few of them on our trip and kind of figure out my favorites and why and do sort of an experimentation with a lot of them that my friend Diana and uh, Debbie Held have both been uh, working on over the last uh, year or so. Diana Twist, who's a, a dear member of our community and also a dear friend of mine, um, has been wor working through her spindle fleet and sort of reflecting on it and I just really like that idea of sort of figuring out what spindles need to go and what spindles need to stay. Now on this trip, uh, I had this all packed, I had it all organized, I had it all ready to go, and I left it at home on the kitchen table. So we got on the road, we were about two hours from home, and I realized that I didn't have any of my stuff. So I ended up doing a lot of knitting on this trip, which I enjoy uh, when we're on these big trips, because of course we've got many, many hours of driving. From our home to Liard Hot Springs is about 17 hours. So that's a lot of knitting time. Um, but I do find that by usually about halfway through our trip, depending on how long we're gone for, my hand does start to bother me and I have to take breaks. It's just overuse and doing the same thing over and over and over again. The other thing that I have really found with a lot of my knitting projects recently, and I've talked about this on the podcast, I haven't felt a lot of flow with them. I felt like I've been kind of forcing them a little bit and that some of them just haven't been going as smoothly as I would normally have sort of would normally feel about my knitting. Knitting for me is very um, it, it's easy but in the sense of like I've done a lot of it I know how how to make patterns fit my body um, I really enjoy it I like working with lots of different yarns I enjoy working with different color but this year there's been very little flow and I've actually felt quite burned out with my knitting this year and I haven't been putting a very much pressure on myself to make a lot of things or to uh, knit a lot of garments and at the beginning of the year I had made up my make nine that I wanted to do by the end of the year and I've kind of just put it off to the side recognizing that this year is not the year to put a bunch of pressure on myself to make a whole bunch of things so if you're feeling the same way or you've been kind of maybe not experiencing that same level of flow that you normally would with your knitted projects. I'd love to hear more about what's going on with you and why maybe you think that that's the case for you and uh, throw it into the comments here on YouTube or, or in the Patreon post associated with this vlog. I, I'm, I'm curious to hear what, what others are experiencing this year. I did finish a couple of things right away as soon as we left, so I'll share those with you. Um, the first one, and it may blow out the camera a little bit, but the first one is my Enchante. Um, this pattern was gifted to me by Hannah of it, from within our community, so thank you again, Hannah, because it was just so kind of you. It was for my birthday. She gave it to me uh, back in June, which was just really, really, really kind. I basically knit this with very few modifications. The one thing, though, that I did do is the back neck is supposed to mirror the front neck very closely. So while it's not as deep as the front neck, it's it's close. So after I had knit the back yoke, uh, done the three needle bind off at the shoulders and then picked up and knit the I-cord bind off that finishes off the neckline, I just felt like the back neck was too low. Um, when I put it on my dress form, I immediately just didn't love it. I tried it on myself, didn't love it. 
and I decided I had the time we were driving a long distance anyhow I may as well rip back pull out the three needle bind off on the shoulders pull off the I cord bind off I know it sounds like a lot of work and lift the back neck and the result is that the back neck is more in line with the shoulders so it sits more level with sort of the, my my anatomy and, and, and my back shoulders and my back neck. I just generally prefer having a, a higher back neck rather than having a swoop at the back. It's just what I prefer. So I did add one full pattern repeat across the back before I started the shaping. And I think for me personally, the results are a lot better. The other thing I did, I did lengthen the torso. This is gonna be an ongoing theme throughout this vlog, lengthening of the torso. I just prefer my sweaters a bit longer. I'm long torsoed from my underarm to my waist is nine inches. The average, whatever that means, is about four inches. So I'm about five inches longer in the torso than the average, again, whatever that means. So I do find that I need to lengthen my sweaters. Um, for that same reason, I prefer high-waisted jeans because I need that length uh, in the torso to fit, to fit me properly. I didn't make any modifications to the shoulders or to the arms. So after you knit straight and finish off the lace of the um, uh, arm sky, you actually just pick up and knit straight. So this is meant to be a drop, a sort of a modified drop shoulder uh, cardigan. Sorry, pullover. Uh, oh, oh. I think it would be a true drop shoulder if it was just a little bit looser and a little bit bigger. I will say I knit the size to fit me that would give me about two to three inches of positive ease and I kind of wish I had knit one size bigger um, to give me even more ease but I'm curious to see this is a 50% uh, Beaumont 50% alpaca. I'm really curious to see whether or not this is going to have quite a bit of drape after it's washed and blocked. It's been quite cold on our trip the whole time we've been sitting sort of in the 15 degree to 20 degree uh, Celsius uh, range during the day, but at night temperatures are dropping down to eight and nine degrees. So it gets quite cold at night up here, even at the end of August. And uh, I remember uh, my parents talking actually some years when we still lived in Prince George and Dawson Creek and we had snow um, in at the end of August, beginning of September. And any of you guys who are from Northern Canada and from Alaska will, will know that that's not necessarily uncommon to get the odd snowfall. So because of that and because of getting cold temperatures at night, the last thing I wanted to do was have wet sweaters with us and trying to dry them. So none of my stuff has been washed and blocked this trip and I'll do all of that this week when we get home. So it'll be interesting to see with the 50-50 Beaumont and Alpaca how much drape and how much this sweater will grow once we are sort of once it's washed and blocked. So in keeping with our camelids theme from this summer and into this month into October while we, when we finish up with cam, spinning camel fiber. Uh, and I also threw in yak fiber just because it didn't really fit anywhere else. Um, it'll be really interesting to see, to, to spend some time reflecting on, on how this, this yarn washes and blocks. The other thing you may have noticed, you, you may not, there is kind of a fuzzy appearance to this sweater. It was held double with uh, kid, kid mohair, kid mohair silk. Um, which was a yarn. I had two skeins of it. I picked it up from Chaotic Fibers in uh, on the island, on Vancouver Island here in British Columbia. And um, again, it'll be interesting to see how that plays into the drape, uh, the final drape, and how this blocks out. I'm kind of expecting it to stretch quite a lot, uh, just based on the looseness of the stitches and the looseness of the fabric. But again, we will see. So that is that project. Now the second project was a sweater that I had already knit before that I regrettably, I think, put in the donation pile years ago, which I still actually can't really believe that I've done. And I'm curious to go through a couple of totes in our basement. And I'm wondering if maybe my original Larch cardigan got put in there. Um, because if so, that would be really great, but I'm not certain that that's the case. This is a pattern uh, written quite a number of years ago by Amy Christophers, Amy Christophers. I'm not totally sure how to say her last name. I always fumble over it. Um, this is knit with twisted rib at the hem 
and then you cast off and, and, and pick stitches back up to create this beautiful braid at the bottom hem and then you knit up up the body separate for the fronts and the backs shape the yoke uh, both front and back and go back later and pick up the shawl collar the shawl collar is created by a series of short rows that you pick up as you work um, so you just start with your back neck stitches and then slowly work your way around to create this gorgeous shawl collar once you're finished picking up you knit straight so that you are then in line with the rest of the sweater you can see that there's sort of this straight knitting here out to the end and then you go back and pick up the rest of your button band knit and cast off I've mentioned this throughout the year about my knitting that I just haven't really felt a lot of flow with my knitting this year everything feels like I have to knit it twice or rip back or redo things this was no different I had cast off the shawl collar and realized that I forgot to pick up all of those stitches I once we started driving I went back picked them all up it was done within a day but it just still felt like one more thing that I hadn't sort of read the instructions even though I knew this pattern and knew what to do say lovey after you finish after you cast off you do some um, single crochet some uh, um, crocheted chains uh, to create some eye uh, buttonholes and sew on a couple of buttonholes to tack the sweater closed after us being away for a couple of weeks I was thinking about this cardigan and thinking about this finished sweater and looking forward to wearing it in the fall and I realized that when I knit this last time I actually did add on the inside of the sweater another crocheted chain and a, and a button on the inside to sort of fasten it on both sides so that it wouldn't pull open and so when we get home I may I may add that um, because I do have a third one of these buttons and could add one that's matching to the inside of the collar which I always think just looks really professional the sleeves are then cast on at the wrist and same as the um, lower hem you knit uh, in twisted rib cast off and then pick up on the wrong side to create a lovely braid knit up the sweater shape the sleeve caps cast off and then you sew them in after the fact and I think actually the sewing on this turned out quite well I was actually quite quite happy with this um, when I when I looked at my my finished handiwork sewing in sleeve caps is not my favorite thing to do I do tend to avoid it at all cost um, but I think in this sweater the quality of the pattern the fact that the pieces fit together I had gauge um, I was I knit this on four millimeter needles which is what what is called for in the pattern um, or maybe it was 3.75 millimeter needles actually it was 3.75 millimeter needles uh, but I did have gauge and uh, it's created a really lovely fabric this yarn is not hand spun this is deep 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 old stash yarn uh, this is a uh, a three ply BFL from my friend Lynn of West Coast Color in Tappan, British Columbia. I've talked about West Coast Color lots and lots and lots on the show. I absolutely love Lynn's colors. And um, this is was one of her sort of dye experiments when she first was starting to dye and show up at um, fiber festivals and shows. And it was kind of a one off one pound skein of uh, 1400 yards of yarn for 450 grams or a pound. And um, I just kind of bought it on a whim and have struggled with what to do with it ever since unfortunately the sweater only took about 900 yards of yarn so I do have leftovers I was hoping that it would use up close to almost all of the yarn that I had but on the other hand I'm just really glad that I have something so wearable and I'm looking forward to getting this washed and blocked once we get home and like my enchanté I will uh, get some photos taken of it and whatnot once we get home I did want to share with you this yarn was ripped and re-knit quite a number of times in various projects over the years as I tried to find something that would work for this yarn and honestly it was kind of Ravelry to the uh, rescue this time around because I plugged in my gauge plugged in the weight of the yarn the amount that I had and just populated patterns and that's how I sort of re-found the large cardigan and ended up knitting it into this yarn but because the yarn had been ripped and re-knit and washed so many times there were quite a few places where the three singles um, were not in sort of intact anymore where one of the strands was still um, 
uh, sort of intact, if you will, but the other two have broken. So there's quite a few places on the inside of this cardigan where the ends are all woven in because I was constantly checking the yarn to make sure that it was structurally still stable and intact. And if not, had to keep finding places to uh, um, rip the yarn and, and reattach. So that was kind of a bummer. So a sweater that I had brought that I had hoped to fix uh, while we were away is my stro stone crop pullover. So what I did with this is I actually ripped out um, the bind off. Oh, there's a huge mistake. No way. I'm going to have to fix that on our drive tomorrow. Darn. There's a big mistake in the, in the hem. So I had ripped out um, where the hem was on this and I added an entire repeat of color before redoing the uh, ribbing again. I had bought a petite uh, skein from Katrina to finish this off. This is her yarn, Tough and Tender in Deep Jungle. And with just using that uh, second skein of yarn, which is just a petite, um, just, just about, I think it's like 20 grams of yarn or something, I was able to add an, an extra three inches to the body of this to make this closer to 15 inches long. This sweater, I never wore it because it just wasn't long enough. So now with the added inches, I can wear it with um, a pair of jeans and I'll feel a lot more comfortable rather than pulling at it all the time. The other thing I did was tightened up the neckline ever so slightly, just a little bit. I just ran a, a piece of yarn through the cast on edge and just tightened it up and literally tied a knot at the back of the neck just to tighten it up a bit. It was way too stretchy and uh, it was just way too wide on, on my shoulders. So again, this needs to be washed and blocked and I have to fix this uh, mistake, unfortunately, that's at the bottom on the hem here. I've got a pearl, pearl, pearl instead of knit, pearl, knit, pearl, which is very, very obvious. So I'm going to have to rip back and fix that, unfortunately. But that was really nice to add those extra three inches and to get that done over the course of a couple of days towards the beginning of our trip. And as you can see, it just comes down a little bit further on my torso and will be more comfortable to wear. So two sweaters that I wore quite a lot on this trip was my Magnolia Bloom, which was knit in Aran Weight CVM yarn from Custom Woolen Mills in Alberta. I absolutely love this sweater. I already ripped out the ribbing at the bottom hem of this sweater once to lengthen the sweater by about two inches. After wearing this for about five or six days on our trip though, when it was really, really cool, um, I can see that I need to add another inch or two. Uh, it's just not quite long enough for how warm this sweater has the potential to be. Um, if it was just a little bit longer, it would come down a little bit further on my torso. And um, I wasn't pulling at it or anything like that, but I could just feel that a little bit more length, I have so much of this yarn in my stash, it would be well worth it to lengthen it just a little bit more for just increased wearability and warmth. So I'm gonna do that when we get home. And the other sweater that I had the opportunity to wear that while we were away, that was another sweater I knit within this past year was my Shifty. Now, in some ways, I love this sweater. It was a sweater that I have been wanting to, to make for a really super long time. I had spun the yarn specifically for this sweater. The problem that I ran into as I was making this sweater is the blue is very, very bright. Even on the camera, you can, the, the blue just jumps right out at you almost immediately when you, when you see the sweater. And I had tried, like on the Love Note by Tin Can Knits, a high-low hem so that the front was a little bit shorter than the back. For whatever reason, after wearing this a couple of times, I just don't like it. And I think part of it is that the front is quite a bit shorter. When we're away and we're traveling and it's cold out, I want a sweater that comes right down that's quite long, uh, that I can wear a long-sleeved t-shirt on with underneath and be really comfortable but also really warm and as soon as a sweater is a bit fiddly or that I'm pulling at or that just feels like a lot of work to wear I immediately just don't choose it um, I want to be able to pull on a sweater like my Magnolia Bloom and just wear it and know that I'm going to be warm when we're pulling out heavy woolens like this when we're this far north 
We're usually wearing mittens. We're usually wearing toques. It's usually quite cool. Um, we sometimes run into rain where we're wearing rain shells over, over top. I don't want a high maintenance sweater to have to wear. So when we get home, I have tons of this yarn left for this sweater. All, all of these colors that are in this sweater. Um, I have lots and lots of these yarns left. And what I'm actually going to do is rip back on the sleeves and the body to where the pink ends and get rid of all of the blue and either knit in more of the gold that's in the yoke that I love so much and alternate that with the pink for the rest of the body of the sweater or just have gold at the bottom and also lengthen the sweater. That seems to be a theme. So lengthen, take out the blue and just rethink sort of the overall color scheme of adding the blue into the sweater. It's never been my favorite right from, the, from when I finished it. Those of you who follow the podcast and know, um, followed sort of the journey of the sweater, you guys know that I wasn't keen on the blue anyways. And just the usability of a sweater, it needs to be top notch. This is a really super warm sweater because it's basically double knit for the whole sweater um, because you're carrying the other, the second color behind the color that you're currently working with because it's all mosaic knitting. So it's slip, slip, knit, knit, slip, slip, that type of knitting. And that means that you basically have two layers of um, knitted fabric laying over top of each other, like two strands of yarn is what I mean. Because of that, this sweater has the potential to be very, very warm, which it is. It's 100% Falkland. This is again dyed by my friend Lynn of West Coast Color. And I love her colors. I don't want a sweater like this to sit in the closet. I want it to be a regular staple in what I wear. So like the stone crop pullover, um, these colors dyed by Katrina and the color work in this sweater was spun by me. It's Fractured Dawn and I spun it as just a blended three ply for the Wheeler for Ashford um, for, for an article in, in there, the Wheeler magazine that uh, Ashford puts out every year. Um, I, I, I want to wear these sweaters. I don't want them to sit in a drawer somewhere collecting dust or collecting moths, heaven forbid. So it's worth it to fix these sweaters and you only get a chance to sort of reflect on what you like and don't like about fit and color with garments unless you wear them. And you can't wear them for two or three minutes and take a couple of photos and call it done. You need to actually wear them. And so wearing these in the campgrounds when we're driving, being around, um, doing things gives me an opportunity to, to sort of figure out what it is about the garment that doesn't work. So with this, it's the high-low hem, the brightness of the blue that I just don't personally love, and um, the fact that this sweater could be a lot more utilitarian and could be a real staple, just like the Magnolia Bloom in my uh, wardrobe. So the final two projects that I wanted to share with you are the two that I actually had an opportunity to cast on this trip. Uh, these were really exciting because I was just really ready for some new projects. As you guys know, I've talked about this a little bit all year. My making this year has not felt particularly easy. It's very much felt like I've had to force it. I've had a lot of stuff that I've ripped out, remit, um, projects that just didn't go as smoothly, fit issues, uh, ripping and re-knitting like with my uh, Enchante. Working with old yarn like my large cardigan that had already been knit and re-knit so many times that I was working with a lot of joins and having to work in uh, yarns and weaving in lots and lots of ends because of dealing with skeins that had been cut and recut from other projects and then ripped and re-knit and washed and re-skeined and uh, there was even parts of the yarn for this project where the yarn had actually become threadbare and only one of the three strands because this is a three ply uh, it's a it's a BFL three ply um, where one of where only one of the three strands was still intact the other two had broken so lots and lots of weaving in ends and making sure that the yarn was was uh, structurally um, stable still and, and had good integrity so when I came to some new knitting projects I wanted to work with uh, some patterns that I was excited about and some yarns that I was excited about. I didn't, I don't really have any sweater quantities of hand spun right at the moment that I'm just absolutely dying to work with. 
Although I do have some projects brewing at the back of my mind. So I decided to knit with some of my yarns that I had bought over the last year or so that I was excited about. So this first yarn uh, is Kelly from our own community. Um, this is her 100% uh, Cheviot yarn that she has made um, in Northern Alberta. Uh, Kelly lives just outside of Edmonton, um, Edmonton, Alberta, and she's one of our, our very active community members and has been around since almost the beginning. And she naturally dyed these yarns. So this is the Lunenberg Pullover by Amy Christophers as well. Her patterns just fit me absolutely beautifully. I it's like they're kind of written for me. So this is the 35 inch bust. It's knit on 3.75 millimeter needles. I got gauge with that so I didn't play around with that anymore. And then the colors that I chose are these gor this gorgeous uh, matter yarn, uh, matter colorway that, that, um, that Kelly had dyed. Um, the green is a marigold that she had done. And then I threw in just some white undyed cheviot that uh, I ordered from Kelly and then also some uh, Llama Suffolk naturally colored uh, topi, topi brown uh, yarn that just kind of worked with the overall colors and uh, didn't take away from the orange and the green. The dark main color is actually indigo. Um, I think it was marigold and then over dyed with indigo so you get this gorgeous teal dark 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 teal color and uh, the overall color work was really fun to work there's pearl stitches in the color work which made it even more interesting to work and this is the front so you work your short rows for the yoke to lift the back neck after you're finished the color work which I really actually quite liked the effect of because it lifts the back of the sweater like you need it to but you end up starting the color work right away after you finish the ribbing for the for the neckline which i really like as well so this is thus far two skeins of the indigo i have five and i'm about halfway through the body as of right now expecting to use um, the third skein for the rest of the body and then probably one and a half for the sleeves so that'll give me the option to lengthen it if i want to and, which I probably will. The, the sweater only uh, is 13 inches for the body and that's nowhere near long enough for me. I need something more between 15 and a half and 16 and a half inches for a body. So that's probably what I will do. So the sleeves are currently on hold and they will be knit afterwards and then I'll be done. I won't finish this before the end of our trip, but uh, I've definitely made some awesome progress. Kind of reminds me actually of really deep fall, almost kind of um, Halloween type colors. So I'm really hoping I can get this done quickly once we get home so that I can wear it through September and October. The other project that I'm working on is the Ustava cardigan. Um, this is a really neat cardigan, mostly just because I absolutely love the stitch pattern. Um, the stitch pattern is made with uh, ribbing and garter and you start by casting on at the uh, collar and the collar is uh, picked up and knit after the fact and then you add button bands. It has a um, crew neck for the uh, front of the cardigan that you build as you knit and then you knit straight after you separate for the arms. So raglan uh, style which you guys know I really enjoy and uh, I'm knitting this out of some yarn that I bought when my local yarn shop closed down and when, when Sue retired. This is by Estelle Yarns and it's a llama, a natural llama worsted weight uh, yarn. Recommended knitting gauge is on four and a half millimeter needles. This sweater is actually knit on four millimeter needles and I actually really liked the fabric that I was getting so I just went with that um, because I had gauge as well. Um, this is a 20% llama, 80% merino. So not normally what I knit with, but because we've been studying the camelids recently, I kind of went with it. And thus far, I'm again expecting quite a bit of drape, just like my Enchante, because of the alpaca content. This has the llama content, so you're going to have a lot of stretch, a lot of drape, not a lot of memory, even though you've got 80% merino in there. Um, those two will work uh, to sort of balance each other out and I think create a very warm cardigan but also a lovely drape and a lovely hand. This cardigan is actually knit if it, with the original pattern if you were to follow the original pattern you actually hold 
two yarns double, just like the Enchante where you hold it with a kid silk mohair. Kid mo kid silk, a silk kid mohair. Kid mohair silk, however you say that. Anyways, you know what I mean. And it gives the garter ribbing uh, texture kind of a fuzzy appearance. But because I had a yarn that was already a worsted weight, rather than holding a DK with a lace weight or trying to find another yarn or buying another yarn, I thought I would just work with this one yarn and highlight just the characteristics in these fibers in this one sweater so that we could explore that more fully uh, since we've been studying the camelids through the, the summer and into the fall into September's content where we finish off with that. Um, I guess we're finishing off with camel. Uh, unlike the uh, llama worsted, the alpaca Beaumont that's held with the kid silk mohair, kid mohair silk yarn, um, this has ended up with a real halo and it obscures the lace patterning, whereas in this, because there is no kid mohair silk, uh, there's no obstruction of the uh, of the pattern stitches. However, um, they both are going to have a lot of drape and I think that the kid mohair um, the, will help to combat some of the drape once this is washed and blocked. Um, that yarn will, while having lovely luster and sheen, is not going to have the same uh, principles of drape, even though there is that silk content in there, the mohair is going to help with the, the structural integrity. So it'll be really interesting to see how this washes and blocks. I very rarely take pre and post measurements of washing and blocking, pre and post, but I think I will with this yarn so that we can uh, reflect on on how much this sweater changes because I'm expecting it to grow quite a bit um, So that's what I've been working on this trip, and I hope that uh, this was helpful as you uh, Go through your own gar your own ha handmade hand knit gar garments and figure out what works and what doesn't work and re Remember and re realize that it's worth it sometimes to do some modifications to rip things out and to re-knit so that it increases the wearability and of, of your knitted garments, especially if they're in hand spun, because you don't want that sitting in, in your uh, drawer just collecting dust. So until next time, happy spinning, happy knitting. Bye guys. I hope that the change in sound didn't mess you up too, too much and that while you had to up the sound, now you probably have to drop the sound again. So I'm sorry for the uh, changes in the sound on this particular premiere episode. I wanted to share with you some of my spins in progress and the one in particular that I thought that we could talk about today was a spin that I started a while ago and I have not shared on the podcast mostly because we haven't really had time. We've been working through the spinning sheep breeds kit from the School of Sweet Georgia for my new workshop and some of my other stuff has sort of been pushed to the back burner a little bit. So this is some soulful stash that I've had for a while. It's from the summer of 2019. This is called Itsy Bitsy Experiments and it's actually from the Itsy Bitsy Yarn Shop up in Whitehorse, Yukon. And um, this is a 100% super fine baby alpaca. And I just uh, love these colors, love the idea of spinning this. I am generally very sensitive to alpaca. So I was a little bit concerned um, that I wouldn't be able to spin it, but so far so good. So let's pivot to my other camera and I will show you guys what I have been working on. This has been on the Kromsky Minstrel, and I've been spinning away on it uh, very slowly, mostly when I don't really have anything else to spin and anything else that I'm currently working on or like, you know, if there isn't a big um, deadline that I'm working on or something that, you know, absolutely has to be spun that week, I've been taking advantage and uh, spinning up some of this when I can. As you can see, I have not stripped it down. I haven't done anything to the prep. Part of the reason is because as you can see, as I try to pry it apart, it's a little bit fold. I could have thrown this on the drum carter and opened it all up. But in what I've actually found has been the most helpful is to just spin. So let's get my wheel running here because I am currently spinning in the wrong direction. And uh, this wheel does have a little bit of a tick. Um, and I, I tried to minimize it before I started recording, but unfortunately there is sort of a little, a little bit of noise back there. And hopefully the microphone just doesn't pick up too, too much of it. 
But what I've been doing is just grabbing just a few of the fibers and keeping my back hand quite far back and just holding on to the fiber supply itself so that the back hand is really just guiding where, where I'm grabbing from in the fiber rather than actually manipulating what I'm actually spinning or what I'm actually grabbing. I'm kind of just using it to direct so that I can spin across the top, grabbing just a few fibers at a time and working my way through all of the one color before I sort of move on to the next color. Uh, so that as I spin across the top here, I can actually spin through all of that color and minimize how much is of the next color is, is coming into the yarn before I'm quite finished with the previous color. Spinning across the top is a great skill to know how to do. Um, because it is one of those things that if you're trying to keep those really, really long, slow transitions of color going in your yarns, uh, you can really maximize that by not stripping down your comb top and by not um, worrying about whether or not you've spun through all of the color or not, you, you know, by stripping it all down and creating all these little you know, nests of fiber and chunks of fiber and so on and so forth, you can just spin across the top. And et voila, you have long, slow transitions of color. My plan with this spin is actually to do something very different from what I usually do. I have no intention of trying to make sure that these colors stay together in the finished yarn. Uh, I didn't strip it down because it just proved to be quite difficult to strip it down. So instead, I uh, kept it all as just the comb top. And what I'm going to do is when I am finished spinning through this 100 grams, I am actually going to wind it all off onto weaving bobbins, um, hopefully just three, and then I am going to ply these colors are all, they're so analogous. They don't need to all be kept together or kept clean or chain plied. I can just ply them and not worry about it. And what I'm hoping is because I didn't strip the comb top down and really make it, um, uh, you know, all of these really short lengths of, of color, Instead, I kept these color repeats really long, you know, because I'm spinning through all of this purple and then I'll spin through all of this silvery gray pink and then all the way back through the purple. So by doing that, um, I'm going to keep these these color repeats quite long and uh, very sort of intact, if you will. And the result will be hopefully long, slow transitions of color in the singles so that when they ply up, it'll give the yarn an overall homogenous feel, just like the yarn that I spun and plied for, it was organic Polworth, and I used that yarn for my jingle pullover that I wear at Christmas time, that's by Isabel Kramer. It's like the Christmas baubles through the yoke, and uh, that yarn worked so well because of those long, slow transitions of color. I'll maybe insert a photo here of what that yarn looked like and what it looked like knit up in the sweater so that you can see what I'm talking about. And I spun it almost exactly the same way. I didn't strip down, um, I didn't strip it a whole bunch. I, I tried to keep the color really clean and really intact. And uh, then I went to ply it and I didn't worry about matching up the colors or I didn't chain ply or anything. I just uh, wound all of the singles off onto bobbins and then because of plying and having those long transitions of color I ended up with a, an, a yarn where the colors matched up surprisingly regularly throughout that colorway and that was a colorway from Kylan over at Kim Folk Fiber and um, she hasn't been dying the last couple of years because of health, health uh, problems but I'm really hoping that she comes back to dyeing 
eventually because her color sense and her fiber and stuff is just unbelievable. It's just amazing. So uh, if you'd really like to see what my hands are doing here, I can zoom in the camera. I'll do that now. So just watch if you are motion sick in any way. And you can see that I'm just grabbing a few fibers at the top of the comb top here and using my back hand to just guide the fiber. When you guys are in the live chat and we're actually live streaming this and I'm doing this like in real time with you guys, there's always tons of questions. So I'm trying to think of what people would ask if they were sitting in the live chat right now. And I think probably the big thing is uh, that my back hand is really just guiding the back fiber. It's not holding on to it at all. It's keeping that touch very, very light. And uh, I'm just treadling very steadily and grabbing a few fibers at a time. I'll show you the plyback test. That's something that I can show you. This is sort of a lower twist yarn because this is 100% alpaca. It doesn't need tons and tons of twist. And um, I just you know, wanted a really soft spun yarn. I'm not sure if I'm gonna make this a two ply or a three ply yet, um, but that's sort of what the, the plyback test looks like. Just very gentle plyback, very soft yarn. Um, it's probably going to need to be plied a little bit more firmly uh, just for, for where, you know, durability and whatnot, because, um, uh, it's this baby fine alpaca, this ultra, ultra, super fine alpaca, sorry, is going to need a little bit of something to, uh, ensure its durability. And like I said, I'm not sure if I'm going to do a two ply or a three ply yet. I'm kind of leaving that up to deciding later. So maybe this will be finished sometime in uh, later in October or maybe early December and I'll be able to or early November and I'll be able to share this with you but I'm not totally sure I, I'm just kind of you know finding little bits of time to work on this when I have a chance uh, you know sometime in sometimes in virtual spin group when I don't have anything else I'm working on sometimes in um, you know different different kind of snippets of time being on the phone when I when I can have my hands free it's just sort of a little bit of a autopilot spin a little bit default treadling my ratio is 18 to 1 so not particularly slow not particularly fast just kind of middle of the range middle of the road just making sure primarily that there is enough twist in the alpaca that it's not going to drift apart and fall apart. That's the biggest thing. But otherwise, soft spun, gentle. If you missed the alpaca content from back in the summer, I would highly recommend that you go back and have a look at that content. We talked a lot about twist and alpaca, what it, what, how much it needs, that it really resists a lot of, a lot of twist. There's parts of this braid that are a little bit beaten up and were a little bit, um, maybe not handled really, really super uh, gently in the dyeing process. So there's sort of these areas, that, a little bit of chunks, a little bit of fold areas. And it, you know, it's all spinning out. Like it's not a big deal. Makes for a really lovely project, to be honest. I could just sit here and spin all day. The other project that I've been working on that is sort of in honor of our spindle spun, um, from our spindle spun summer that sort of morphed into spindle spun sweater, uh, is a uh, plying that I'm doing of my Jacob. So this is all part of our breeding color study that we're doing right now. And this is my natural brown Jacob that I've had in my stash from World of Wool for quite a long time. And I had spun all of these singles on all of my different spindles, so some on my 35 gram uh, Turkish spindles, some was done on my support spindles, some was done on my, I don't even remember what all the spindles, some of them were done on my Kapar, uh, my little like 18 gram Kapar spindle, uh, which is another type of tur tur uh, Turkish spindle. 
and um, then I made up a plying ball of all those singles. This is 100 grams approximately. And uh, what I'm really hoping for is that this yarn will be applied um, within the next couple of weeks. So I've just been very gently, this is my steampunk uh, plying spindle. I love this spindle. There's quite a few people in the community that have these spindles. I learned about these spindles from my friend Diana, who I'm sure is in the chat today. And uh, she um, is, a, is a big advocate of these for, for plying and Katrina loves hers as well. Uh, they're a little bit heavier and they just make the best plying spindles because if you run this down your thigh um, You can really get a lot of twist into your into your plied yarn very quickly. It just runs like stink and um, They also take about four ounces of fiber which I really really appreciate because so often that's exactly what I'm plying is four ounces of fiber, which is what this is. It's um, 100 grams, just shy of uh, four ounces, so about three and a half ounces. And uh, I, I'm hoping that I'll have this done and be able to share with you some, probably not all, of my Breed and Color Study yarns next month in November when, we, uh, when, I, when I share with you all of my Breed and Color Study that I did for this current study that we're in right now. So I'm gonna to continue to apply this and get this done and, and I'll, I'll share this with you um, when I'm back, probably next weekend, um, I'll be able to share this this yarn with you and, and the, the finished results of, of spinning all of those singles on all of those different spindles because right now there's really no difference between any of them, so. So last but not least, one of my most favorite things to do on the podcast is to share with you our community participation. So let's go to that now and that will round out the show. Okay, so we have a lot of things going on in the Slack channel right now, which is why I wanted to share it with you. And I thought that it would be really fun to kind of go through and share with you. So this is from Elizabeth. She tried her traditional three ply for the first time. She can't decide if it felt like black magic or like torture, but she does like the finished effect. So this is the finished yarn here. I think this is just absolutely beautiful. I love blended three plies. This, these are some of my absolute most favorite yarns. And if you have a look here at uh, her twist angle, at the detail here of just how even the yarn is, it's just incredible. So really, really well done, Elizabeth. Just absolutely beautiful. This is from Megan. She says it might be her best yarn uh, to date. She finished her first hand spun for her shift cowl. So this is going to be uh, part of some more yarns that she's going to do. This is what she started off with. So this is one of those really interesting lengths of fiber where you're not really totally sure what's going to end up until you've spun a few of these. Once you've spun a few of these, you sort of have a pretty good idea of what these are going to end up with. But when you've got that bright pink in there, that blue, that gorgeous green, and that gorgeous yellow, you have every single color of the color wheel. You also have every color of the digital color wheel. So cyan, magenta, and I think it's yellow. And what she's ended up with is just this absolutely beautiful yarn that blends those colors together and you end up with brown. I love this effect. I think it's absolutely beautiful. When you look at this yarn close up, you're going to end up with all of this beautiful heathering and that's exactly what you end up with. But from a distance, it looks really, really uh, analogous and very sort of, um, you know, subtly heathered and, and subtly textured. Look at that sheen in there. Just beautiful, Megan, really, really beautifully well done. I'm not actually sure what the fiber is itself. I don't think that she said, but regardless, it's just absolutely gorgeous. This is from Shauna. This is Tin Can Knits uh, Free, free mitten pattern and she was uh, using some of her fiber and putting it into thrums which I thought was just absolutely fantastic and the inside of thrummed mitts if you've ever slid your fingers in oh they are incredible just amazing 
This is from Kat. Uh, she had some random bags of combed top that were some fleeces that she bought. And this is the result from one of those 61 gram Merino Jacob uh, crosses that she had. And this is just absolutely beautiful yarn. She's got a filter on here with the photo, but I just, this yarn is just beautiful cat. Absolutely beautifully done. Look at that twist angle and how even it is. And then of course, because of that Jacob in there, you've got a little bit of a halo, which is so pleasing. Really well done. This is from Sue. She's been working on a lot of color work and she just did a Farrell workshop. And I was really, I'll, I'll show you her color work samples in just a minute of all the Farrell samples that she was working through. But she's been knitting this up and it just, these colors are just absolutely beautiful. So you've got the primaries in there, the red, yellow, and blue, and then you've got some of the secondaries in there. So she's got the green and the purple. So pleasing, but not a, in, not a rainbow, not sort of in the um, sequence that, that you would expect in a rainbow. She's gonna steek this. And I really like that because it, it, um, it's a great use of, of those colors. It's a great use to you way to use the uh, color wheel without sort of that stereotypical rainbow. I just love this. I think it's beautiful. Thank you for sharing Sue. Um, this is Shetland comb top spun and then dyed. Um, she has to steak it next, but it needs a good soak and a good block and the neck and then the rest of the jacket. This is from Brittany. She's spun a lot, but this was my first time spinning a fractal yarn. And now she can understand why so many people are obsessed with it. So she had two braids left to spin uh, and then she plans to knit a sweater. So this is all part of a sweater spin that she's working on. But look at that yarn. Isn't that absolutely beautiful? Love this yarn. Look at, again, very even spinning. That twist angle is just absolutely beautiful and gorgeous greens and, and purples. And then to sort of balance out that green and that purple in there, she's got, there's that gorgeous gray and it's sort of gray brown. In other places, it's more of a blue gray and it just, it just brings the, the whole braid, it makes it really, really um, beautifully uh, pleasing to the eye. I just love this. And uh, this is what the braid looked like previously. So she's got two more to spin the same way. Uh, she hasn't checked yardage, but what she aimed for was 18 wraps per inch, and this is what she got. 12 twists per inch after plying. She had so much fun with this spin, and it went really fast. And she's been spinning this up on her E-Wheel 6, which is great. We've got some weaving to share with you guys. Megan's been trying out band weaving on her rigid heddle. Isn't that cool? Love that. Love those colors. I haven't tried band weaving yet, but it, it's something that's really captured my imagination. Lots of people have been doing it. And then uh, Mary shares, look closely, a tablet woven band on, on her linen ensemble ready for winter in, the, in Mexico. Isn't that fantastic? So she band wove that and has put it onto her um, camisole there. Beautiful, Mary. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, Janine shared this in the Slack channel as well. This is a DIY warping board that she had made, um, that she'd made up. And so now she's all good to go with, with warping, which is fantastic. Well done, Janine. Uh, happy share. This is from Bridget. Very happy with this uh, alpaca silk huck lace project. So this is a huck lace, and this is a hand spun, hand woven project that uh, Bridget uh, shared back in September that I hadn't had a chance yet to uh, highlight. Just really, really beautifully done, Bridget. I just love this. It's a little bit closer up of the of the weave, and you can see the structure of the of the huck lace in there. I had played with huck lace back um, in the summer, and I absolutely loved it. I just love those floats that are created by warp and weft. It's so interesting. It's also really fun to see your place. These are from Rachel. Um, she is, um, uh, it's so good to see her working on her uh, unit one samples for the OHS. So this is her unit one sample. She hem stitched these. And um, she was saying, I, I asked her what, what she found the most interesting or the most surprising out of all the samples. And she said the three one basket rib really surprised her. And that's this one down here. Just absolutely beautiful. These, this one down here is uh, just basic basket weave. And then this is her stripe repeat and her tabby. 
beautiful. And she chose the warp that was uh, the split complementary option where you use a red, a green, yellow, and a blue green. And she opted to hem stitch, which just finishes off the samples so, so beautifully. Really, really nicely done. Well done, Rachel. So that is some community participation for today. Uh, thank you so much for letting me share and for uh, taking the time to be able to sort of, you know, spend spend a few moments in, in the Slack channel with you guys. It's always a pleasure and there's always so much to share. It's just unbelievable. Um, as people continue to make and continue to share, I will continue to share it on the podcast and it's my pleasure to be able to do so. So I will see you guys on the other side as we head back to the main camera. Thank you so much for being here today and for uh, following along with the show. It's been a lot of fun for me to be able to pre-record an episode once in a while and to do that for you guys sometimes because I don't get to do them very often. So it's really neat to be able to actually do that with you guys. So um, thank you for watching. Thank you for being here today. And I hope that you have a really wonderful Canadian Thanksgiving for those who are here in Canada and are celebrating. And to everybody else, have a wonderful weekend. And I will see you same time, same place next weekend at our regular, sort of in our regular format where when I'll be home. So until then, happy spinning, happy knitting, happy dreaming. Bye everybody. I hope you have a wonderful week. Mm -hmm.